So welcome to this overview of environmental policy. This overview is meant to provide you with one way of looking at environmental policy and environmental problems, mainly in the United States, but also can be applied globally. The first thing to say is that there are many different ways to look at the question of environmental policy and many different perspectives. This is one perspective. It's uh, couched in somewhat of an economic analysis, but also includes many other considerations. So if we begin, we can start by thinking of environmental policy as an intersection between our values represented here in the yellow circle, science and technology or human progression in many ways, uh, which share some space if we think of this as a Venn diagram represented in the red circle, with our values, our societal values, and also um, some economic analysis, uh, which again, uh, share some space uh, with both of these. And they obviously have separate areas and to some degree, um, they change over time. Certainly our scientific technology changes, our understanding um, and our use of technology uh, advances or you know, um, depending on how you, but it changes over time. Um, the way in which our economics evolves as well, and certainly our values, uh, both individually and mainly as a society, as a, a nation, and even global values uh, change over time. But as they change, they do share space. And if we think of this intersection where they share space, we can think of that, uh, you know, the value, science, and economics uh, as maybe where environmental policy uh, derives from. Or, where we get our environmental policy. So the um, environmental policy being somewhat of a, a dependent variable and dependent on these three um, somewhat independent but uh, correlated um, factors, value, science, technology, and economics. Many argue that from an environmental policy standpoint, while the science and technology and economics are incredibly important, the values, our values that we overlay on our science and technology and our economic uh, sort of formulations, uh, our values are the most important factor or variable to consider. And we can think about why this might be. Um, and there are many, different reasons um, people feel this way or you know uh, those who study environmental policy feel that the values um, but uh, if we think about it you know all policy comes down to a question of you know what we do why we do what we do as an individual as a group as a community as a you know national or global community and um, and the consequences of what we choose to do and all of that stems from the reality that um, we have not an infinite amount of resources or choices to make. Um, we have a finite uh, number of resources. So when government, for example, uh, chooses to spend so much of its finite resources in one area, then by definition, it excludes the availability of those resources to be used in some other area. Every dollar that I as a government spend on national defense, that dollar is no longer available to be spent on social welfare, environmental protection, technological research for advancement purposes, or anything else that we might find as a, maybe a, a competing uh, use of that dollar. And the key again here that we always have to remember is those dollars are not infinite. The resources, the available resources are not infinite. They are finite by definition. They're limited. And there's more demand for those dollars than there are a supply of dollars to meet that demand. So when we make choices, those choices often represent our values. So people might argue that environmental policy values is the most important variable or factor or consideration in environmental policy simply because those values reflect our choices and those choices then impact what we do or do or do not do relative to our environment. So 
with that in mind, we can think for values, how you perceive the issue of values. Do you think that it's incredibly important that it is the main driver in environmental policy? Science and technology, we can ask what tools does science and technology provide us to solve problems, environmental problems, for example? Um, are there always technological solutions to environmental problems? If we want to limit our production or use, I should say, of carbon, removing it from the ground, for example, in oil or coal or natural gas, and taking it and reformulating it into gasoline or burning it to produce um, electricity or many other uses. If we want to change that and stop using carbon, then we can think of some of the technological solutions that are available us, to us today that were not available to us 50 years ago, 20 years ago, or even a decade. And we can also understand that from an economic standpoint, that what is available today might be, if it's a new technology, an expensive right substitution, an expensive solution for the problem. In other words, for example, the use of batteries to propel us, to provide us with the energy necessary to move us in our automobiles. Those batteries are a new, relatively speaking, new technology over the past two decades or so. And as a result of that, that new technology is expensive relative to the current internal combustible engines or the gasoline engines or diesel engines that we currently use. And we can think about this with whether it's you know, it's become much cheaper now, but traditionally, at least at the commercial level, uh, generating electricity from the use of coal, certainly, and but also natural gas and to a much lesser degree oil um, was less expensive than some newer technologies, again, at the large scale commercial level, like photovoltaic solar, for example, or wind. Uh, hydro has always been somewhat competitive and nuclear energy generation has always been somewhat competitive. But recently, because of its wide adoption over a period of decades, um, it's, its larger adoption as it continues to be more uh, largely adopted, generating electricity from you know, the use of wind or the use of the sun um, is like hydro, the use of water. Um, and there's also geothermal and there's tidal, there's many other uh, ways in which we can produce electricity um, where the sources are relatively speaking free because they're just naturally occurring. Um, but it's getting much cheaper and in many cases has become cheaper than coal, the, product, the commercial production or use of electricity using coal and certainly um, oil and um, to some degree natural gas depends on where you are. But the point is, we understand that there are always costs and those costs are not static. They, they're not stable. They're not consistent. We all know that we pay a lot less today for computers um, with a lot of capacity and you know processing power that 10 years ago uh, would have cost us a lot more money or 20 years ago or 30 years ago, a similar or even a lesser capable computer would have cost a lot more. We understand that over time, as technology progresses, the adoption of that technology allows for efficiencies in scaling and distribution and creation of those of that new technology such that the drives the price, the cost uh, to the consumer down over time. And of course, when we're looking at new things, those costs at the beginning are, are expensive, they're, they're high. Um, so adoption is difficult. So that's another question, I guess, where it comes to values, where as technology provides us with options, when do we choose those options? Do we choose them when the technology is new? Do we choose them prior to the technology? In other words, do we make a choice? For example, we, by the year 2030, there will be no more automobiles for as a policy that are um, allowed to be sold in state A 
because the state has outlawed them if they're internal combustion engines, only um, batteries or maybe hydrogen or some other uh, non-gasoline or diesel burning, petroleum burning uh, engines will be allowed in that state. That is setting today a standard that hopefully will drive an evolution and you know, fast forward the development of battery and other technologies that will then drive down the cost so that when that transition occurs, it will be much cheaper than it would be if they said, as of today, there will no longer be allowed to be internal combustion engines, as an example, or natural gas burning power plants, or, you know, coal burning power plants, or, you know, so on and so forth. You can just uh, sort of run with this. The idea of the lead time is to allow for, you know, incentives for whether it's private industry, if you're in a capitalist system like here in the United States, or for governments to, um, you know, directly or indirectly help to incentivize the movement of capital, the movement of current dollars towards these innovations, because the promise is that there will be a high demand. And therefore, if you generate supply today, if you do innovation, and if you create economies of scale, aka driving down the cost of these things, then it will be um, to our advantage collectively in the future because we will achieve the environmental goal of reducing carbon, but we will do so in a way that is relatively speaking cheap, that will not be a big sort of sticker shock that we might see today where we could buy an internal combustion vehicle for $20,000 and a, similarly price, a, a similar type of battery powered vehicle might cost, you know, 50% to 75% uh, more, might cost 30, 35,000, even 40,000, even double the price of that similar internal combustion engine. So let's get that cost of those battery co powered cars to be somewhat similar. And we've seen, at least here in the United States, that one of the mitigation measures to try to indirectly stimulate uh, battery power, besides there being other incentives that maybe most of us don't know about for the manufacturers, credits, tax credits, that kind of thing, uh, that makes it cheaper for them to do the business of like a Tesla or other similar car companies that are, gen that are developing um, battery powered automobiles. In addition, we know us as consumers, many of us might know that we uh, can receive rebates both um, in certain states They'll provide you with a tax, an incentive, a rebate, basically, to make the automobile cheaper. And certainly, the federal government has been providing rebates up to, I think, seventy five hundred dollars to try to make those automobiles cheaper to the consumer, to create adoption, to get you to purchase them, so that the price differential isn't as big as it otherwise would be, and then therefore to help create that economy of scale for the manufacturer over time. All of this drives back to our values, because if we don't choose to make these decisions and have these policies, whether they be incentives for the manufacturer, incentives for the consumer in terms of rebates, as I just said, or even just plans, um, you know, laws put in place that identify policies of by this date, all of that relating to the reduction of carbon intensity, without a doubt, that we, we don't want to continually take carbon from a stored place like the under the Earth's crust and, and move it into the air because of the effects. And if we look at those effects, those effects aggregate over time and can be substantial, aka climate change. So that's one way of thinking about environmental policy in the context of these three intersecting sort of areas. If we think of the value side, Values are really, we can think about how politicians sort of, you know, live in the world of values where they help to define or, you know, redefine or confuse sometimes what are our values, but often, you know, our elected officials are there to hopefully, you know, mimic what are the constituents that elected that individual, what their values are, you know, to help sort of push for those values. And they can vary. They can vary between individuals, ideological backgrounds, um, geographic areas, um, for a number of reasons. It can be, um, there's a, a, a litany of different types of variations of how those values can be expressed. And generally, we think of the science and technology area as being sort of the purview of the sort of more objective, less sort of subjective value areas that can change, you know, easily between both within an individual and between individuals and groups, whereas science, you know, we have 
uh, standards, objective standards of measurement, et cetera. We have you know, the scientific method, we have replication, we have all of these rules in place so that the science and technology lives in a world that is less variable based on individual whims or, or differences between groups. You know, we adopt international units of measurement, et cetera, so that we can you know, have consistency. And we know when we say that something works in this way, then in that way is replicable and it will work indeed uh, if that sort of recipe with all of those objective, relatively speaking, objective standards are followed. So uh, something to think about if we were to sort of create a dialect here, that the science and technology lives more on the objective, objective side of the scale, as that might be perceived and understood, and the values is, or the politician lives more in the values or subjective side of the scale, something that is more capable of, you know, of varying over time. And then economics lives somewhere in the middle. Here's a benefit cost analysis curve. And it's specifically from Tietenberg and Lewis um, and one of their, uh, they have many iterations of their textbooks, uh, environmental economics and policy and that sort of thing. But um, if we want to think of the efficient level of emissions, some of you who have an economics background might know this. Many of us might look at this and say, what is this? Uh, the important thing to see is on the uh, left hand side, you know, what we see is uh, cost, we see the dollar sign there, that's just indicating that, you know, cost from zero towards the bottom to let's call it infinity at the top. And the um, bottom line moving left to right, not bottom to top, with the E, uh, the different E's, I will just say that, um, is showing the level of emissions uh, in tons per year. So you have cost on the left and you have emissions on the bottom. And emissions go from, from the left to zero emissions to the right to let's say lots and lots and lots of emissions, infinity. You know? So we have, again, cost on the left and emissions on the bottom and they're both driving. Uh, cost goes from zero from the bottom to infinity to the top, emissions zero from the left to infinity to the right. And what you see is you see two curves. You have to say the MAC curve and the MD curve. The MAC curve is the marginal um, abatement cost. And so that's what does it cost you to get to that level of emissions? Like and marginal just means, you know, the individual unit of cost, the, the next dollar, you know, for to, to get to that level of emissions. So if we were to sort of break this up into gr a grid line and we saw grids and, you know, sort of lines running up and down, we could see each of those as individual units of cost. And then as we moved along, we could see that's what that sort of curve is representing is that as we move, the curve shows that the marginal abatement cost changes. It lowers as the emissions go from zero to infinity. And that makes sense because as we get to infinity, the right-hand side of the emissions, um, if you look at this, uh, that makes some sense to you because if we're not, if we just don't try to control, right? emissions at all, then there are zero costs involved, right? And yet, if we try to completely limit emissions and bring emissions to, as you can see on the left-hand side, it's not at the zero because the suggestion there is it's impossible to have activity without any level of emissions. That would be the theory here. Now, that's technically not true if we use it in some sense of some idealized sense of, well, if we removed, if we're talking about carbon, for example, emissions, then we removed all, um, you know, all oil, gas, and coal from, let's say, commercial production of electricity, industrial commercial production, then um, we're done. We're good. We don't have, you know, if we're just using others, like re what we would call renewable energies, again, solar and wind and, you know, hydro and maybe nuclear, some others. But the, the point is, um, but even in the process of creating those things, there is some level of emissions, let's say, in creating the concrete and that sort of thing. But the point is, traditionally speaking, you never get to zero. You just can't get to zero. So that's why you don't see the E on the left with a little hat on top of it um, at the zero point. There'll always be some level of emissions. So the marginal abatement cost, um, what, we, what we get from this is that it's super high. It's super, super high on the left really, really high up there with the cost. And that makes sense because if you wanna to get to very low emissions, you're gonna pay a lot of money to get there. And then the MD, the other curve that seems to run you know, counter to the uh, marginal abatement cost, the MAC, 
the MD is the marginal damage. And that makes some sense because you know that if emissions are zero or close to zero, the damages are zero. And we can see that on the left-hand side. Whereas if emissions goes to infinity, then the damages go to infinity cost. The amount of damage, the cost that we end up paying for that damage is super high. So there it is. And then you can see the W and the W is, you know, the E with the little star. And what that's telling you is that that where is that efficient level of emissions? Well, it's where those two lines cross. This is economics. This is traditional economics when you're talking about benefit cost analysis. And when you want to find that sort of efficient level, it's that's what you're looking for. That's that sweet spot where the damages equal the abatement cost, where they're about the same, because that means you're at the most efficient, relatively speaking, level. It's a hypothetical. It doesn't, you know, there's no exact amount that we can put there that applies for every scenario. But the point is you could measure this and you could find out effectively where that sort of, you know, that Goldilocks uh, scenario there where it's, you know, which is perfectly not too hot, not too cold, or there's this perfect amount of uh, damage for the amount of cost relative to that damage. And obviously it's not at zero. So the notion here would be, you never think of making the damages go to zero because the cost, uh, the, the cost for abatements are just too high to get there. And certainly you never want the cost of abatement to go to zero because if you do, um, then you have unlimited damages. That's if that makes sense, you have too much damage. So what this tells us though, is that as emissions decrease, as we decrease emissions, right? As we move from lots and lots to very little emissions, which would be on the left-hand side, almost zero emissions, right? What happens to the cost to reduce them? Well, it increases, right? So anytime that we have an environmental policy, for example, where we're trying to limit emissions, every time we look to limit an emission, our cost to limit that emission marginally is going to increase. And we have to understand that. So that means that we're going to have to find dollars in that limited pool of dollars. We're going to have to find some dollars that are being used for some other purpose. And we're going to have to say, we're going to take those dollars from that other purpose. And we need them over here because it's going to cost us to limit, to decrease. And so a simple way of saying that is if we're getting more and more people Maybe it's simple, I don't know. If we're getting more and more people to purchase battery powered cars, and the only way we're doing our, one of the main ways we're doing that is to provide this you know, rebate effectively directly to consumers. And mostly at least at the federal level, it's done as a tax rebate. So it's a credit, it's $7,500, let's call it $7,500 credit in the United States on your federal taxes. It might be more, it might be a little less, depending on the number of factors. So let's just call it $7,500. If you get that credit, that is money that's being taken away from the federal government. That's money that you otherwise, let's say, would pay, or at least some of it, you would pay in taxes. And that money would go to the federal government. It would be used for some purpose. Now that money is gone. And let's say that other purpose includes, I don't know, shoring up Social Security or providing a bigger military budget or... You can imagine just a variety of different things that the federal government does. Now that money is no longer available at $7,500 per person for those other purposes because it has gone to you for this purpose. And that purpose is to reduce the amount of emissions. Let's call it carbon emissions. And the way they're doing it is indirectly. They're not doing it directly by controlling power plants and how they're feeding themselves, You know what they're using to create electricity, that sort of thing. They're just getting you in terms of transportation reductions, not at the commercial level, not at the large scale level, right? But at the sort of individual, you as a residential driver, private citizen driving around in your private vehicle, they're getting you to decrease your carbon emissions relative to using electricity to power your car rather than gasoline. And they're giving you $7,500 for it. And therefore that's taking that $7,500 away from some other purpose. So there is the cost that's associated with, with that marginal reduction in damage if we, if we say carbon is the damage. On the other side, if you spend no money on reducing emissions, of course, what is the level of pollution? Right? It's a lot. It's a lot. And then, I'm sorry, there is the sort of, again, that Goldilocks area where we look for. This is traditional economic theory. 
and we think about the damage function. So what the, the question of damage, right? Most environmental policies, and this is stepping back and not just thinking about carbon or anything else, but most environmental policies are concerned with damage to the environment. And that, that, that term damage, damage from exposure to bad things, for example, like toxic substances, you know, we don't want people, you know, young children, uh, lead paint, for example, that's something that's in historically, we've had lead in paint, and we have a lot of ho older homes where young kids and, you know, we have rehabilitation of those homes, because we don't want kids, you know, getting chipped pieces of paint where they're chewing on that, and there's lead, and they have a disproportionate impact on young bodies. And it's just a bad thing. But there's many other examples, uh, we think of uh, drinking water, Flint, Michigan, for example, I mean, there's many other examples, but you know, um, potable drinking water, water that's capable of being uh, drunk, you know. Um, so anyway, all kinds of nasty things, but there's also damage to the environment that degrades the level of the environment. So there are these direct damages, and we usually think of them in terms of human beings welfare, directly, something that will directly harm a human being, there's no sort of in between phase. This is dangerous, it's a toxic substance. And by definition, we mean toxic because if humans are exposed to it, it creates a negative outcome for humans, that kind of thing. And then there's these sort of indirect damages, and that's damage to the environment that degrades the level of the environment. So that, you know, harms uh, the things that, you know, it's sort of a, a one or two or three steps away from direct human harm. So you can think of, you know, toxic substances that are stored in the soil that if you wanted to use that soil to grow crops, the soil is now, you know, poison for that purpose. And so crops are important because that's the food we want to eat. So that's really important for human well-being, having enough food to feed humans. So if we take the soil, the arable soil, the soil that we want to use to grow things that we then want to eat, and we have a scenario where we're polluting they have a company that as a discharge as a byproduct of making the thing that it wants to sell you it discharges pollutions either into the soil or into the water the watershed that then sort of drains into the soil but then pollutes that soil in a way that it makes the soil incapable of being used to grow crops you see so there's this sort of indirect you know or at the example that's stated here, uh, destroying wetlands that re remove water purification functions for humans. You know, a lot of New York City, most of New York City gets its water from a reservoir. Um, and that reservoir uh, is in the Catskills, I believe, right? The Catskills, the, yeah, I believe it's in the Catskills. But that reservoir naturally um, is fed through uh, a huge watershed that naturally purifies the water. And the um, if New York City had to send its water, the amount of water it consumes through a man-made, a human-made purification system, a water filtration system, a big, large one, um, if it had to do that, the amount of money it would have to spend is in the billions and billions of dollars per year. And so it saves, you think about the watershed, the natural sort of filtration that happens when that water up in the mountains there in New York makes its way slowly through its watershed area, through its reservoir, and then through the pipes to New York City. It is the value of those wetlands to filter and make that water consumable for humans without having to do something with a technological solution, without having to filter it through, you know, again, a human intervention. It's worth a lot of money. That's sort of an indirect. And certainly here, I mean, in Massachusetts, where we are, it's not necessarily where I am, but up in Boston, the Quadden Reservoir is another example. Many municipalities benefit, large cities benefit, and populations from uh, and the nature's natural processes. So protecting those watersheds, protecting those environments, right? It ensures that, you know, humans can consume things. And so they are really important. Uh, other examples are producing greenhouse gas emissions, of course, resulting in a warmer climate. So, you know, preventing ourselves from doing that so that we don't suffer from all of the negative outcomes of having heat island effect, having, you know, these really, really hot, uh, you know, uh, summer periods where you have those, you know, people will die because we have these 
terrible uh, heat spells or, you know, all of the effects. I mean, we have sea level rise, so coastal communities, uh, we have the types of storms that, you know, increased categorical hurricanes, increased uh, uh, not only um, frequencies of storms, but intensity, like increased, uh, you know, going from a level three hurricane to a level four or even a level five. Uh, the destructive capacity of that. Um, same thing with tornadoes, the frequency and intensity increasing. Those are all sort of so, so you know, having a less carbon in the atmosphere um, in, you know, helps to mitigate the effects of those higher frequency and intensity of storms. And the thing that we don't want is the intensity of storm, just like we don't want um, lead in our paint, or just like we don't want, we want our land to be able to be easily, you know, uh, crops to be easily grown in that land without any, you know, those plants taking up things that are toxic to humans. So um, these are all things that we want, but they're a couple of levels move, removed, a couple of factors removed um, from that. So that's the indirect. So we have direct damages directly to humans, indirect, and then we have non-use or these sort of, uh, you know, damage to environmental values. And now we're back to the values, the more subjective side. So for example, the loss of wilderness or unique species, think of the Endangered Species Act, uh, that we cannot replace, and, you know, just the loss of it. Most of us, I mean, I don't, polar bears, as far as I know, even for um, Inuits or, um, you know, others that uh, live in the Arctic, um, and traditionally, traditionally, mainly in the Arctic, I don't think polar bears have been um, much of a prey species for them. They're an apex predator. I don't think there's the numbers, but also for other reasons, they're dangerous and uh, maybe for meat purposes. But um, aside from my personal ignorance, let's assume polar bears aren't used by many humans for direct consumption, um, you know, maybe for heat and that sort of thing, the polar bear skin and its fur, that sort of thing. But otherwise, just for direct human use is very limited. But we think of, you know, or caribou, caribou maybe more so. But the point is there are species um, that we um, might care about, um, but we don't use directly. And so that loss of the loss of that species, um, the loss of unique wilderness, wild places, you know, we might not use them, but they have value nonetheless. So it's that sort of non-use uh, damages. So when we think of damage function, we have to think about them in terms of our sort of, you know, are we talking about direct, indirect, or sort of these non-use, um, which, you know, starts bringing us back into that sort of value side of our equation here for uh, environmental policy. As an example of the damage function, how would you measure the damage of a coal burning power plant emitting sulfur dioxide? How would you do it, right? So sulfur dioxide creates acid rain, it's nasty, usually comes in the coal. Um, there's you know, different areas of the country tend to have from natural conditions, different levels of sulfur. Western coal tends to have a lot of sulfur. Uh, Eastern coal, Eastern side of the country has less, but let's just, sulfur is a problem, has been a problem. It's been pretty well controlled through the Clean Air Act, but let's, uh, let's just think about this from a sort of academic standpoint and think about how would you measure that damage? So certainly you can measure the emissions, let's say. say the technology allows you to measure the amount of sulfur that's coming out of those smokestacks in coal burning power plants as they're burning the coal to create the, to drive the turbines to heat, you know, the water to drive a turbine to create electricity. Um, there's this obviously residue. And as that residue is working its way up the big pipe there to be smokestacks, to be uh, sent off into the air. There is a technological advancement. There is a meter there that can read the amount of sulfur. So we can measure, let's say, those emissions and then determine the resulting level of the ambient air quality. So we can make some calculations based on how much sulfur is coming out of there and then how does that sulfur disperse in this environment? You know, and that changes, it depends on the area. Do you have a lot of wind? Does it go up high? Do you have, you know, is it the summer versus the winter? Are you having, you know, an inversion? You know, or is it, is it hazy, hot, and humid where you are? Is it being pushed down? Where does the local population live? So, you know, you can determine resulting level of ambient air quality. You can estimate the human exposure. Say, wow, if this thing's near or if it's close to an urban area with a high population, that's worse for humans, at least. You know, if that damage function is a direct damage function, right? We're just thinking about human, direct human exposure versus if it's a rural area, not a lot of humans. You can estimate the physical impacts and you can determine the values associated with these impacts. The key is to accurately determine the value of the impacts, right? So that's the hard part, right? What kind of values are we talking about here? And, um, you know, is it okay? 
is it okay to harm? You know, what's an acceptable, acceptable level of harm? Who's the person you're using? Are you using a healthy adult? Are you using, a, you know, a child? Um, are you, you know, a newborn who hasn't, you know, developed all of their sort of, you know, capacities to deal with uh, negative environmental uh, effects? Are you uh, using an elderly person who's frail and, you know, otherwise, you know, highly susceptible to any changes in air quality, You're using a person that has significant asthma or lung related issues, right? Where is your sort of measure of human impact? And, uh, you, you know, what are you using? So are you using the least common denominator, right? Those that are most affected by any changes in good air quality, or are you going to use, you know, sort of the, the person, you know, as your reference point, the, the, per, the average super healthy, normal adult person, that kind of thing. And so some problems with this direct damage approach. The basic problem is almost always it's seriously incomplete. And the best example, and I think this comes from Tietenberg as well, suppose we estimate the direct damages of you getting a head cold. We can come up with a direct cost of whatever the aspirin, whatever the remedy, the thing that allows for your head, you know, the discomfort that you're experiencing, that the symptom basically of the head cold, mainly the throbbing head. There's also congestion, that sort of thing. Let's just say the, the, thro the, the headache. We're just reducing the headache and it's $1.27. It could be more, it could be less. Yeah. Is this the true value of the cold? So when you think about the effects of the cold, right? Is this what you would be willing to pay to avoid the cold? So if you're saying, you know, is $1.27 a, a quality representation of the effects, all of the impacts of having a cold? Now, if you lose a day at work, you can certainly say, well, no, it's not just the, the thing that reduces the discomfort of the cold, the actual direct right um, uh, remedy and the direct uh, sort of harm, but it's also a lot of sort of indirect things. Um, again, like the soil for producing the crops. You know, I I work and I only have a limited amount of sick days, and if I'm not at work and I don't have a sick day available, then I don't get paid for that day. So, or even so, even if I do get paid, I lose a sick day. So that sick day is no longer available for some other sickness, some other purpose, right? That resource of sick days is not infinite. It's finite. I only get 10 a year, that sort of thing. So if I use one, I only have nine now. And if I get sick with some other problem um, that causes me 10 days of illness, now I only have nine days of sick leave instead of 10 in order to you know, deal with that. So I've reduced my capacity. So maybe that's an, an additional cost we need to consider. And by the way, being sick is terrible, right? Being sick stinks. Um, there is a personal um, well-being, right? A personal sort of quality of life uh, question when it comes to being sick. So you can think about that. So the basic problem with direct damage approaches, when we only look at the direct damages as maybe you can figure this out from an environmental policy. So thinking again, of environmental policy, what is it? What is it meant to do? And what do we consider when we implement environmental policy? If we just look at that direct damage approach, it's probably limited. We're probably not thinking of all of the things that are important to think about. Here's another example, uh, another sort of curve or relationship of ambient SO2 or sulfur dioxide, which is the main thing that comes out of those um, when you're burning coal, those smokestacks that we were just talking about. And what we can see here is a relationship that shows the, the housing price, the value of the home goes from zero to infinity and the particulate content of ambient air. So how much uh, sulfur is in the air around you? So it goes from zero to the left to infinity to the right. So as the housing price increases, as we can see on the, what we call the x-axis, uh, but the going up, as the housing price increases, um, we see that the particulate content is zero the most value you can get out of your home is with the cleanest air, with the least amount of sulfur in the air. As the amount of sulfur increases in the ambient air around, the value of the home, what you could sell the home for, decreases. And that should make sense to most of us because it's like trying to sell farmland that's full of contaminated soil where you can't grow anything that you can then feed or sell to humans, right? It's the same thing. It's like, if that soil is in perfect condition, completely arable, no toxicity, no bad things for humans that would then be absorbed into the things, the plants that we're growing to consume, then it's like having a house with no sulfur around, right? 
really good air quality. You could think of noise quality, right? Not a lot of noise, no, uh, you know, the house that's further away from that train that makes a lot of racket or, you know, <laughs> or the construction, it is just, you, you understand there's a, a number of ways to look at this, but so the house that's um, in the cleanest air environment is going to be worth more than the house that's um, full of, you know, sulfur and acid rain and, um, you know, poor air quality. So as the level of SO2 increases, the value of the home decreases, all other things being equal. And this tells us there is a direct value to environmental quality. And so we can see that. What if the cost of reducing SO2 concentrations was less than reduction in home value, or, you know, how much your home reduced? Would that alone justify a policy of reducing uh, sulfur dioxide emissions in the area? And if not, what else might you want to consider? So that's relevant, right? If we're thinking of environmental policy, like, yeah, okay, if this is true, and again, all other things being equal, you know, maybe the if the home is in Manhattan or in midtown Chicago, I'm sorry, downtown Chicago, and it's next to the, you know, subway station or the L train if it's Chicago. But the point is, if you might be willing to pay more for that house, even though there's a lot of noise because it's located close to all of a bunch of other things that you highly value, um, close to your work, where you make a lot of money because it's in you know the middle of the city, close to... Uh, all the things, all the food, all of the, you know, social, all of the, all of the things that you value highly. So that's the all of the things being equal. Um, here we're saying this is the same kind of house and the same kind of location with the same kind of, um, you know, uh, otherwise other demand, you know, other consistent demands uh, and values that people would value. So, you know, if we could reduce the SO2 emissions for less money than the um, reduction in housing price, would it be worth it? And then the question is, maybe, yes, it sounds like it from a pure academic standpoint, but then again, I understand that I'm helping to maintain the housing value of some individual or individuals in an area at the expense of doing some other things. Again, it's the other example I used. If you're spending $7,500 as the federal government to pay back somebody, to give somebody as a reduction in what they, in buying a battery powered car, then that $7,500 can't be used for a litany of other purposes. It's no longer available for those other purposes. It goes directly to that individual who purchased the battery powered car, nobody else. It's not like that person shares it with you. They get it for their car and hopefully if there's enough of them, collectively, assuming that the electricity that they're using to then charge up their batteries doesn't come from dirty sources, they are then reducing the aggregate amount of carbon that is in our atmosphere in an incremental marginal way for themselves and for everybody else because we all benefit from less carbon in the air. So them not pumping out carbon by burning gas does help on the margins, all of us, but they are getting the $7,500. They're not sharing that with anybody else. Now, that works great for those people that can afford that car, that can afford upfront to pay for the higher priced battery powered car, correct? It doesn't work so well for those that cannot afford it because they cannot get that credit, that credit is after you purchase the car, not before. Although I should say there are some interesting financing options where the dealer will take on that. If you sign over the right for the credit, then you get it off at the time of purchase. So there are all there are ways around, um, you know, having to wait to get the value of it. But let's just assume, for the most part, that doesn't exist, and that you know, it's really a benefit for those that can afford to pay up front. So if we think of that, or if we think about, in this case, reducing spending federal dollars, the equivalent of that $7,500 to help reduce sulfur emissions in that area, if it's less than the cost is less than with a reduction in housing price, that's great but it helps to maintain and increase the housing price of those individuals who own those homes. There is a benefit that accrues to all the people in that area for higher quality air, no doubt. And that benefit even is not equally distributed. And what I mean by that is those that are more sensitive, 
will benefit more than those that are less sensitive to the lower quality air. And that's the truth. And we need to consider that. But the point is, um, would it justify, you know, alone, just that analysis? Would it justify, yes, we should do this. We should reduce the sulfur emission simply because it will maintain the housing price. We have to think about, well, does that really make sense? And what does it mean in terms of making sense? Is it okay if the benefits of this program go to certain individuals and those benefits on the margin are much higher for those individuals, they benefit more than the distributed benefits of the reduced sulfur for the population at large. Is that an equity issue? Is that a value issue we need to consider? Something to think about. In terms of costs, in terms of opportunity costs, whenever resources, natural, financial, are committed to one enterprise, they can no longer be used for some other activity. This loss of potential use for other purposes is considered an opportunity cost. So as I've been saying, when that $7,500 is used in order to reimburse somebody for buying a battery powered car, that money is no longer available for any other use by the federal government. When the federal government decides to spend $2 trillion on, geez, that's a lot of money. I don't think it's $2 trillion, but let's say, a trillion dollars on defense out of a $4 trillion budget. That trillion dollars, that 25% of the entire budget, that is not available for any other purpose. It is simply going to defense, gone for any other purpose or use. So we need to think of the opportunity costs. Whenever we commit resources in one place, then they are no longer available for some other purpose. And so instead of creating a reduction in sulfur, the money could be spent on compensating people who suffer higher incidence of asthma. There's one example. Because if you create the reduction in sulfur, in our example from the previous slide, the homeowners certainly benefit if it's maintaining the value of their home. And there's other benefits because if their home is valued more than the assessment on that home for taxation purposes is probably higher and therefore the amount of property tax income for the community is probably higher. I mean, there's many ways and many layers to this onion, many ways to look at this. Um, it's not an all or nothing. Never in policy is anything simply an all or nothing or a binary choice. It's either a one or a zero or a yes or a no. It doesn't really work like that. But we can see, putting aside some of the nuance, that yeah, if most of the benefits accrue to homeowners, and that's a segment of society, maybe it would be better to just allow the pollution and instead of spending that reduction money, the money it would cost to reduce or abate the damage and the pollution and spend it on compensation. Maybe it's better to compensate those individuals. And then there's environmental costs. So environmental protection programs also result in environmental costs. And that's maybe funny enough, but reducing airborne sulfur emission power plants by stack gas scrubbing also leaves a highly concentrated sludge that must be disposed of in some way. So in other words, if you're going to reduce sulfur emissions, it's not by preventing the sulfur from being on the coal, it's actually stopping or trapping, scrubbing they call it, but trapping that sulfur before it makes its way up the smokestack and out into the atmosphere. It's grabbing it before it leaves the facility. It's still being burned still there it's just capturing it like a big filter and then that filter you know that that stuff has to be disposed of and it's toxic so you know you think about those costs of implementing an environmental policy must also be considered um people have talked about for battery powered cars now you know we're getting to the point where we have what uh i don't know million mile batteries that those batteries that and you know are the lithium ion batteries that are being produced in you know present day are capable of, you know, continually being used for the equivalent of a million miles of driving. And most of those cars will break down well before then. So, you know, those batteries have other uses and, um, you know, so, but aside from that, as that technology progresses and as it evolves, um, aside from that, there is the problem with, you know, both sourcing of at least lithium ion batteries, right? The sourcing of it and all of the attendant costs associated with mining lithium. Lithium is a rare, um, it, it's a rare element. It's hard to find. It's only in certain places. And most of the time you have to do a lot of digging and it occurs in countries where maybe um, a lot of that is happening and maybe not the most sort of, um, 
I don't know, environmentally uh, aware way. Um, but there's more than that. It's just even just the components. Um, they are not in and of themselves. They're, they're not something that can be easily disposed of. Uh, so end of life uh, disposal, just like having the sludge from the sulfur, the batteries when they're no longer viable to be used, what do we do with them? How do we use them? Again, some of this is being um, considered and resolved now to some degree, but uh, it's still an open question. And so the point is there's always costs, even environmental policies, when you're meant to reduce something in one area or protect something or resolve one environmental issue, you end up creating um, a maybe subsidiary, but another environmental issue to consider. Enforcement costs. Most environmental regulations are not self-enforcing. Thus, the enforcement costs, government spending on EPA, Environmental Protection Agency here in the United States, personnel, et cetera, must be considered in any environmental policy program. Makes sense, right? So it's not, you think about the program of the tax rebate, um, monitoring that, ensuring people are properly um, identifying that they have that vehicle. At the federal government level, it's a tax credit. In Massachusetts, currently, it is a rebate check that is given to you. So it is an after the purchase rebate that is provided to you. So in Massachusetts, at least, for example, if you were to purchase a battery powered vehicle, you would be entitled to a $2,500 rebate in Massachusetts. Now, in order to get that rebate, you have to purchase the car then you have to apply for the rebate. There has to be this government entity and these individuals that are paid by the government to receive your app, to develop the application, to um, receive your application, to process your application, to determine whether or not you've actually purchased the battery powered car that qualifies for that $2,500 rebate, to receive the funding from the state legislature to, um, you know, put that funding in its proper place to account for it, to monitor it, to then send and cut the checks, to provide all of all of the attendant resources and everything, the bureaucracy that is involved with government doing something, something new. If we didn't have this program, those individuals, those resources, all of that attendant cost with the bureaucracy of developing this government agency in order to ensure that there is a proper you know, process and then enforcement of this rebate for buying battery powered cars in Massachusetts, it wouldn't exist if there wasn't this environmental policy, if there wasn't this rule, this law that had been put in place. So there are all of those attendant enforcement costs and they exist everywhere whenever there's an environmental issue. And then there's a the question of efficiency. Remember, we are looking at the most efficient policy program, the one that best balances the relative benefits with the attendant costs of a program. The more comprehensive we can become at considering all costs and benefits of a program, the better the environmental policy, generally speaking. All of that nuance I mentioned just a little bit ago, all of those sort of let's put this aside because there are nuances, they're really important because if you're going to get to the bottom of whether or not there's an efficient level, there's a perfect level. If you think of that curve, the two curve, the benefit cost analysis and where those two lines meet, if there is truly to know where those two lines meet, you truly have to know all of the attendant benefits and all of the attendant costs. And not just the direct ones, not just the obvious ones, but the not so obvious or the indirect or non-attendant, you know, the sort of trickle down benefits and costs because they happen. And then often, even when you account for them, you can have the alternatives analysis, which is, okay, so if we reduce sulfur emissions, good for the homeowners. But maybe it's better to just pay, use that money that to reduce, better to just pay individuals who suffer harm. Maybe that's better. Maybe that works out better, depending on all of these sort of like um, connected sort of um, dominoes, you know, that are from that different analysis of relative benefits and attendant costs. So let's measure all of those different things and let's do a sort of comparison of different ways of doing this. Try to determine all of the benefits and costs and then make an informed decision. And of course, even in the process of doing that, there's a 
a lot of time and energy and expense that is incurred. So even government considering doing A policy versus B policy versus C policy requires time, energy, and resources. So how do we internalize costs? Do we, for example, privatize the resource? Maybe it's just better, for example, one example is, hey, let's just privatize the air. Let's have the company, the coal company, for example, or the electricity generation company who's using coal, let's have them buy up the air around. Purchase it, literally purchase. Let's come up with a number. Let's come up with an amount. We can do that. We can figure out, you know, relative to the damages that are going to occur, the reduction in home values, et cetera, et cetera. Let's just come up with a number. Let's have them purchase it. Let's have them buy that up front. And then they have the right to pollute the air because they've already bought the resource. They can do what they want with the resource. They've paid for the pollution up front. And then we can use that money in a variety of ways. It's income, it's direct. We, the government can use it. It's a one-time deal because usually when you, you know, privatize a resource, it's not just for a day, but there's also that. You can, we do this in fishing in the United States to some degree. We can do, um, we, can, we can provide individuals with the right to fish a particular area of the public domain, the, the oceans are owned by the public. They're not owned by private individuals. You know, so we think of the United States exclusive economic zone, 200 um, nautical miles uh, from the shoreline. And uh, the state has an interest uh, as well. We're about three uh, nautical miles, but if there's a coastal state, which there always is. Uh, but then, you know, the point is government owns that resource and anything that's in it. So basically when you think of fishing, like commercial fishing, it's really giving individuals a right to go out and capture a public resource. And the, that right can be given for a period of time, can be given for a year. And they have that right and that is their right. And sometimes they can even trade that right. They could sell it to somebody else for the period of time that they have it. Sometimes it can be forever. Uh, sometimes they can be given that right for, you know, in perpetuity, but can be repealed at any time by the government because it's the government can't just give away public resources. So, you know, um, it can grant a lease. We do this all the time, right? Oil, offshore oil and gas leases. Think of those uh, as another example where we're giving a right for some private individual to go out into a public resource, the ocean, you know, go drill down into the bedrock, find oil, public resource in a public area, uh, and then capture that public resource. And it's usually the moment of capture where we transition, where that public resource now becomes private. So the oil that is brought up or the fish that are caught now, once they're captured, are now the property because that's the incentive. They're paying, these companies are paying, you know, the fishermen's paying for everything to go out and fish. They're paying for all of the resources and capital to go do that, plus their time and energy. Same thing with the oil and gas companies. They're going out and spending all of their capital. So there has to be a benefit for them to do that. And that is once they've captured that public resource, they now have it and it's private. And now they're gonna help put it into our hands. They're gonna make it a public net benefit uh, so, but that's can be for a period of time, it could be for a year, two years, it could be six months, a season, you know, 10 years indefinite until, you know, a decades, that sort of thing, leases for periods of decades, so on and so forth. So we can do this where we privatize the resource and give that person a right to give that entity, that private individual a right to the resource, and we can limit it, it could be forever, but it could also be for less. So here are examples to put all of this into context in terms of trying to understand environmental policy. So here we're going to do, and we're going to do it with automobile policies based on pollution. So current day, we want to reduce the amount of pollution. We can call it carbon for sure. Um, and so internal combustion engines and really, you know, old cars, old cars, low miles per gallon, they're dirty. Not only are, were they, you know, designed for bigger engines, you know, less fuel efficiency, that's how they were designed, but certainly because they're old, they just don't operate as well as they used to. So here's a, our first scenario to consider in terms of a policy to deal with polluting cars. The use of certain automobiles are simply banned based on the emissions, generally older, cheaper automobiles. The individual is left to purchase a newer vehicle or find other means of transportation. The government offers no aid, no subsidy to those who are affected. So we can think about this, this is incredibly efficient 
from an efficiency standpoint, it's like if you want to lower automobile emissions or you know the pollution that comes from automobiles, banning um, automobiles based on emissions, like those that emit a lot, is the simplest way to do it. It's the fastest way. You know, the what is it? The shortest distance between two points is a straight line. This is the straightest of lines between those two points. Could not be more direct. And if we're thinking about efficiency of policy, like does the policy meet its intended goal? I can't think of something that is better than this in terms of getting to that goal quickly. You simply get rid of those gas guzzling pollution prone vehicles. Of course, we can think about who does this affect? Who generally owns older, cheaper automobiles? Rich people or poor people? We can slice this many different ways, but just you know, for time purposes, because we don't have forever and ever, and this is already a long introduction to environmental policy, but not too long. Um, but if we just look at it, is it wealthy people or poor people? And even if a wealthy person has an older, cheaper automobile, what can the wealthy person do if that automobile is banned? They can easily afford, right? A non-banned automobile because they're wealthy. So we can say that this is incredibly efficient, but it has probably a disproportionate impact. Let me think about that. Let's hold on to that. Scenario two, the government caps the amount of miles allowed to be driven by any particular vehicle. So instead of banning, it says, okay, um, we have a pollution measure. So the amount of miles is based on this pollution measure of a monomobile. If you're an older car, you know, and you're more polluting, then you can travel less, you know, there's less miles to drive. If you're a newer car or more fuel efficient car, generally those correlate, then you can drive further. So in this case, older automobiles generally can only travel 5,000 miles per year under the program. So if you have an old automobile, you can still use it, but in a limited way. So this cap is different from the ban. It's easier or less dramatic on the end user because it still allows the people who can only afford and have older polluting automobiles, it still allows them to use their automobile just a lot less. Now, many of you might say 5,000 miles per year. Well, you know what? I work from home now or I'm, you know, I'm, a, I'm in a COVID to post-COVID world where, you know, um, I don't, you know, that's okay with me. But for most people, they'd say 5,000 miles a year is nothing. That I'll be done with that in a couple of months. Um, so that doesn't really help. That's just not great. Now, of course, it's better than the banning legislation, right? You can still use the car. You just can't use the car a lot. Of course, on the other side, shortest distance between two points, straight line. This line, this line of a cap in comparison to banning legislation is a little more squiggly, right? It's a little longer. It's not as straight, right, as the banning legislation. So it does not meet the goal as well, but it's a little bit fair. Scenario three, government places a tax on emissions of all automobiles. Every automobile, there's a tax, and it's based on emissions. And when the factors are considered are miles driven per year and the emissions of the automobile. Those with a higher emission vehicles pay a rate, a higher rate per mile, and those who travel more miles pay a higher tax. And everyone is subject to the tax. Now, if you're driving a battery-powered car and it has truly zero emissions, doesn't matter, I guess, how many miles you travel per year, right? Because it's miles driven per year times the emissions of the auto. If the emissions of the auto is zero, the amount you're going to pay is probably going to be zero. If you have a hybrid, uh, you know, a car that has an internal combustion engine, that's super efficient. Obviously, you're going to be able to drive a lot more miles driven per year if you make 60 miles per gallon, for example, um, because the emissions of the auto is a lot lower. So the amount you're going to pay is less. Now, if you have a clunker that gets 10 miles per gallon, you know, and you still drive 15, 20,000 miles per year, you're going to pay a lot because it is a rate per mile. Now, the benefit here of this tax is it is going to cost those who cause the most emissions a lot more money than those who have no emissions pay zero or much less emissions, pay a little bit. And over time, that should incentivize people, 
It allows you to travel. If you have the clunker, you're not limited to 5,000 miles a year. You can go 20,000 miles. You're just gonna have to pay for it in addition to all of the other things you have to pay for. Pay for more gas because you get less miles per gallon, so on and so forth. But no limits, no 5,000 mile limit, no banning legislation. You can, you can go as long as you want, as long as you can afford it. And certainly if we think about it, if this tax is directly related to emissions, so the money it's generating is based directly on emissions. Now, if government is doing its job right, you call it something like a Pagovian tax. You can look that up. If government's doing it right, then it's going to take all of this income, all of the money it makes, and it's going to use it directly, directly for mitigating and reducing carbon emissions. So in the case that we've talked about, when money is taken from one thing, it is no longer available for that thing because it's being used for something else, right? We talked about that in a finite world. Well, in the tax situation, if this tax is being used to raise money to combat carbon, the emissions of carbon in the atmosphere, then this is money, if it's being all earmarked for that purpose, that is being generated through the tax for that purpose. So in this case, we can say money income. We have an income stream to directly generate funds to, to deal with carbon emissions. And there's a variety of ways we can deal with it. We can then use that money right to incentivize the development of battery powered automobiles to reduce $7,500 rebate, $10,000 rebate now, $12,000 rebate, $15,000 rebate. Get your you know, battery powered car, help the manufacturers lower the price of those cars by making more and more of them and help the consumers afford the car by making it cheaper and cheaper, right? Ah, oh, you're paying $10,000 a year because you have a clunker with this tax just to ride the, drive the car because of the carbon tax, 10,000 carbon tax. Man, wouldn't you rather get a $10,000 rebate if you just go, you, you see the point here. So the tax can be highly efficient if it's used properly. Now, it is not a direct line necessarily, right? If we think of the shortest distance between two points, the banning legislation seemed like a you know, straight line. This is, I said direct line, I meant a straight line, I'm sorry. It's squiggly. But depending on how it's used, it might not be super squiggly. It might be relatively straight. It all depends on how that money is used and the effect of the tax. And of course, what matters there? What is the rate set at? How much does the worst offenders end up paying? Getting the price of carbon right really matters here, really, really matters. So, you know, getting that tax rate right, you know, the amount of money you pay per mile that sort of thing, depending on your emissions amount, how much you're paying. You don't, you know, it's, this is again, a Goldilocks scenario. If you charge too much, it ends up being banning legislation, right? And if you charge too little, well, then it's kind of like a free for all. And if it's not a lot of money, then people will simply incorporate it into the cost of doing business. And it really won't lead to different outcomes. However, you will still receive that income stream, less money to be used to mitigate the effects of carbon in our atmosphere in other ways. So it still provides government with a new resource that it didn't have otherwise. It's taking money from consumers and you know increasing its budget for carbon reductions or carbon mitigation in other ways, depending on what environmental policy they choose. Point is, you can see the benefit of a tax um, in terms of its sort of um, it's variability in, in approach. And again, here in terms of fairness, well, it's unfair for those that have, you know, the dirtiest cars that can't afford to pay the tax. And maybe that ends up resulting like banning legislation, ends up being like banning legislation for those individuals. But the benefit here is it, instead of just the banning legislation, which applies to certain vehicles, this applies to every vehicle. So everybody's paying for their relative amount of emissions which is different than many of the other examples we've used, which is showing that, well, if we're gonna reduce sulfur, we're gonna increase home prices for some people. If we're gonna give $7,500 back for buying a car, that's not coming from this kind of sourcing of funds, right? Uh, for buying a battery powered car, it's only those individuals that are buying battery powered cars that are gonna benefit from that, you know? And then the benefits of lower carbon are, you know, sort of in the population in general. Here, more people pay, more people pay into the system. Final scenario, 
Government distributes rights to air quality to private individuals through a bidding process. The private individuals own those air rights, including the quality of the air. The private individuals can sue those who harm air quality without agreement to do so. You know, so the people that are, uh, and enforcement is through the courts. So in this case, think of a situation where we talked about before the, you know, power generation company, right? The coal burning power generation company wants to buy the air around it so that it can throw sulfur into the air. That's one way to look at it. Another way to look at it is the in National Environmental Organization buys the air rights around a power generation company and says, yeah, that's my air. I don't want anything coming into that air. And then the power generation company says, oh, geez, I'll pay you XXXS, you know, and, uh, and uh, it's up to that company, that entity, the, let's say the environmental um, organization, whether or not that amount they're willing to pay is high enough. Of course, to a point, you know, um, the power generation company will never pay more than whatever value it can get out of dirtying that air or putting the sulfur in the air, because otherwise it'll engage in some other right choice. It'll filter it out. It'll pay for the filtration technology if it's cheaper, or um, if paying for that air to dirty the air costs them too much money, more than they can make uh, either break even or make a small profit in generating the electricity, then they'll simply choose to go out of business. But the point is, the private rights is transferring, we talked a little bit about this before, is transferring that right to some other entity and letting the market figure it out. And so you care about air quality, then environmental organization raise enough money to purchase the air rights and then just leave them alone, protect them. Nobody can then dirty that air. If you power generation company care more about using it and it's cheaper for you to buy the air right than it is to buy the technology to scrub the sulfur out or to you know stop using coal and figure out another way, natural gas or some other non-sulfur producing, right? Or let's do a wind farm or let's do a solar farm, you know, if it's about carbon, um, then you know, then buy that air right or engage in that alternative activity, but otherwise government gets out of the process of trying to figure out what's the best use. It starts the use, but like in the fishing example or in the oil and gas lease, offshore oil and gas lease, the air is a public good. But if government can then, you know, divest itself of that public good for a period of time, give somebody else the ability, give the market effectively the ability to determine what is the right price. So in this case, you can look, um, so in the tax case, we can look at PAGO or Pagovian taxes for efficiency purposes. And in this case, we can look at a Coase theorem if you want to. The notion that if you just privatize everything, and I'm oversimplifying this significantly, folks. So, but the, the idea, the general idea that if you privatize um, all different kinds of what we normally consider public or common goods, if you privatize them, then the markets can figure it out. And as long as you have direct access to the courts in order to enforce your rights, quick and easy access, transaction costs, uh, going to court is, is time consuming and expensive. So you wanna reduce those transaction costs, but assuming you can, uh, and you have direct access and easy access to these, um, you know, to these enforcement mechanisms, then maybe privatization really is good. So let's just look at these scenarios quickly uh, as a sort of summary, um, all four of them, and think back to their sort of the efficient level of emissions, our little friend over here, if you remember the efficient level of emissions. Um, scenario one, banning legislation. Super efficient, has equal application, but a highly unequal impact. It is truly the shortest distance between two points. It applies equally, but in terms of you know all cars that meet the requirements, so it's equal in that sense, but its impact is highly unequal, meaning that those that can least afford newer cars, more efficient cars, are the ones that are going to be most impacted. Scenario two, cap and trade, you know, older 5,000 miles a year, more pollution, but less unequal impact. So it's a little less unequal, but we get more pollution. We get that squiggly line, you know, instead of a straight line between those two points. Scenario three, the tax on the miles driven times the amount of pollution. That's even more pollution, right? Than, you know, the uh, second, right? Likely because there's gonna be those people in between, but an unequal impact, but a lot more choice. 
there certainly is an unequal impact. Those that can't afford that drive the older cars are going to pay much more, but there's more choice. There's more incentive for alternatives. And if that tax revenue is being used well, then it can mitigate the effect on those that are least capable of affording the alternative. You could give more money to those that can't afford a newer car to help them afford a newer car through this sort of tax if it's working correctly, Pagovian. Scenario four, privatization, right to air quality. Pollution level is sensitive to supply and demand. So depending on you know, where the sort of market is, depending on who has access to capital and how much they're willing to pay for the right to either pollute or protect the air resource, that will define, the market will sort of define. And that we can think of uh, Coase theorem, Ronald Coase and Coase theorem. And, you know, we can think in that scenario, direct versus other damages, you know, so it's paying for what, what are you paying for exactly, right? Are you paying to pollute? Are you paying to protect? Are you paying for, you know, an opportunity to, to just maximize the income potential of, you know, of the air, that kind of thing. So thank you very much for listening to this. I, I hope uh, you get a a good introduction or you've received a good introduction to environmental policy from this perspective, our sort of values, science, and economics, uh, and the shared space that they exist at. So what you should get from this is, yes, environmental policy is incredibly complicated. It is, um, because like any other policy, it is conditional. It's conditional on factors that are somewhat objective, and most importantly, like we said, values, factors that are highly subjective and subject to change and even subject to change based on what we're talking about, what we're trying to do. Many of you might agree that protecting the air is important or good environmental air quality or carbon reductions are important, but how we do it, those four examples, for example, um, some of you might disagree significantly with some of those options. You might disagree with all of them, and some of you might agree with most of them or some of them. And certainly you probably have preferences, one over the other, this one over that one. So the point is, even when we agree on the goal, often we can disagree on how to get to that goal. And that is incredibly important to know when you're trying to understand and think about environmental policy especially environmental policy in context, what it applies to. So thank you again for your time. Uh, I hope this was helpful for you.